You may notice in your bulletin this morning um, three different verses from the Gospel of John. However, because it's Communion Sunday, I decided to shorten the sermon a little bit. So we're just going to be focusing on John 3, verses 1 through 17. This story this morning is the story of when Jesus meets Nicodemus. Now Nicodemus is only mentioned three times in scripture and all of them are written by John. Who was Nicodemus and why did the Apostle John think he was important enough to include him in his gospel? This is what John writes from chapter 3 verses 1 through 17. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus. And do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God was so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world him. This ends the reading. Nicodemus was a Pharisee who served in the temple in Jerusalem. He was one of the highest ranking Pharisees who was well respected by his peers and had great influence over the common people. Now, there were many characters in temple life and when we read the story of Holy Week it can get a little bit confusing. So it might help us to review who they are and how they influenced the events of Holy Week. The Sanhedrin was the overall ruling body, kind of like the Jewish Supreme Court. The leader of the Sanhedrin who presided over the trial of Jesus was Caiaphas. He was the high priest who organized the plot to kill Jesus. The Sanhedrin was made up of Pharisees and Sadducees, kind of like our Republicans and Democrats. Most of them were priests. Rabbis and scribes were also part of temple life. They weren't priests, but their roles were to study and maintain the written copies of the sacred writings and to teach these to the common people. There was much hostility between the Pharisees and the Sadducees because of their different beliefs. The Pharisees were experts in Jewish law. They believed in the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, plus the writings of the prophets. They also believed in the coming Messiah and in life after death. And they believed that God's word and his promises 
taxes were only for the Jews. Pharisees received their financial support and goodwill from the common people who followed their leading without question. The Sadducees were Jewish, but they also adopted Greek culture and parts of their religion and language. They were members of the aristocratic and wealthy society. Their job was to maintain the temple, and they were responsible for performing the ritual sacrifices. But the most contentious differences between the two groups were these. And this is one way you can tell them apart from Pharisees. The Sadducees were sad, you see, because they only believed in the Torah, but not the writings of the prophets. They were sad, you see, because they did not believe in a coming Messiah, and they did not believe in life after death or resurrection. The Pharisees and Sadducees were often on the opposite sides of many issues. However, when they saw the people becoming followers of this new teacher, when they felt their authority and livelihood being threatened, they called a truce, and they came together to find a way to get rid of Jesus. But not every one of them. Nicodemus had heard of this new teacher, and being a teacher and a lawyer himself, his curiosity pressed him to find out more. He, want, he went to hear Jesus speak, but he stayed at the back of the crowd, in the shadows. When he witnessed Jesus performing miracles, he remembered the words of the prophets saying that when the Messiah comes, he will do these things. It became clear to Nicodemus that Jesus must be sent from God because no one else could do the things that Jesus was doing. But the Messiah? No. Nicodemus was drawn to Jesus, and he had to know more. Even though he was a religious leader, over time his ministry had become more of a job and less of a calling. Like most of the members of the Sanhedrin, he was more devoted to following rituals and keeping the law than pursuing a personal relationship with God. After hearing Jesus teach, Nicodemus felt that maybe he had missed some crucial truth. Although he possessed great knowledge of scripture and the law, there was an emptiness inside of him that his religion had not filled. He knew he was headed in the wrong direction. Perhaps Jesus could provide that important missing detail. But he was afraid to be seen with Jesus in public because of what the other Pharisees would think. So he arranged to meet Jesus at night, in secret, in the shadows. He wanted to meet Jesus alone so he could ask questions and learn from him. So Nicodemus came to Jesus with an open mind. He needed his questions answered so he could figure out who Jesus really was. What was his plan or his mission? Was he a threat to everything that the Jewish people believed? Was he really the Messiah? These were the burning questions that he wanted Jesus to answer. Nicodemus' problem was that his religious beliefs were based on facts and not on faith. His new interest in Jesus was based more on the miracles that he saw Jesus do, rather than the words he said. In effect, Nicodemus was telling Jesus, if you prove yourself to me, then I will believe you. But Jesus doesn't waste any time. Instead of trying to prove that he was the Messiah, he begins the conversation something like this. You may be inquisitive about who I am, but I want you to think about who you are and what you need from God. You are a sinner, and you need forgiveness. He quickly follows that shocking confrontation with, You are a teacher of Israel, and as such you know a lot, but there is more to know. 
As a teacher of Israel, you must learn something more. Then Jesus spoke these most memorable words from the Bible. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall have eternal life. That is who I am. That is what I am doing here on earth. I am the Son of God, doing the work of God, so that people, including you, Nicodemus, might have eternal life. Jesus follows this by telling Nicodemus that the only way into the kingdom of God is to be born again. A concept that even a learned Pharisee didn't understand. What did it mean to be born of water and the Spirit? Then Jesus starts talking about the wind blowing, which is the Holy Spirit living within us, the Spirit that comes only from God. This was just a bit much for Nicodemus to take in. He was familiar with the prophet Ezekiel's prophecy that says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. Could this be the spirit that Jesus is talking about when he said you must be born of the spirit? Nicodemus was hearing a new teaching from this man who was sent by God, a teaching that sounds impossible. Jesus tells Nicodemus three times, I tell you the truth. Will Nicodemus believe him? Will he come to believe in him? Or will he reject him? Try to put yourself in Nicodemus' place. Imagine that Jesus is telling you about spiritual things that you have never heard of. Imagine that this new teaching goes against everything you have been taught your entire life. And this man, this teacher, Jesus, is challenging you to set all of that aside and accept his word as truth. Jesus is eager for Nicodemus to ponder all he has heard and then accept the truth in both his mind and his heart. But Nicodemus is torn. If he gives in to his fear and remains a Pharisee, he will not be able to enter the kingdom of God. If he listens to his heart and follows Jesus, he will be rejected by the religious leaders. He will lose his influence, his income, his job, and his reputation. He will have to set aside the religious practices that he's believed in his whole life for an uncertain future and possibly face physical harm or death. Will he give in to fear or follow his heart? Nicodemus wants to be part of this new kingdom of God. He wants to be born again. He's already a follower of the Jewish law, but in order to enter the kingdom of God, he has to become a follower of Jesus. So Nicodemus leaves that evening's encounter with Jesus a changed man. He had a new understanding, both from God and about himself. While he believed that Jesus was a man sent from God, Jesus wanted Nicodemus to believe that he is God sent as a man. Nicodemus' conversion was not instant, but it was growing. He continued to listen to Jesus' teachings from a distance. His devotion for Jesus grew so much that when the Pharisees and Sadducees were talking about ways to get rid of Jesus, Nicodemus spoke up in his defense. He risked his reputation and high position, telling the council to condemn, not to condemn Jesus without first hearing what he has to say, without hearing to find out who he was and what was he doing. His statement was bold, and the Pharisees immediately became suspicious. Jesus was exposing their hypocrisy, and Nicodemus was defending him. 
The Pharisees chose to protect themselves rather than listen to Jesus' message. They became obsessed with getting rid of Jesus just to save face. What was good and right no longer mattered. The last we read about Nicodemus is that he, along with Joseph of Arimathea, asked Pontius Pilate for permission to remove Jesus' body from the cross. They take him to Joseph's own tomb, anoint him with an exorbitant amount of expensive myrrh and aloe, and then the tomb is closed. Some religious scholars write that after Jesus' resurrection, Nicodemus joined the growing number of disciples and preached the gospel to the early church. The story of Nicodemus is our story. It is the story of every human being who first hears about Jesus and then must make a decision whether to pursue a relationship with him or not. Now, if we've never been told about Jesus, then there's no decision to make. But once we have been told, we must act. There's no going back. We can no longer claim ignorance of his existence. Like Nicodemus, we have to make a choice. Are we going to believe him, believe in him, or reject him? Once we hear about Jesus and the new life that he brings, why would anyone reject him? Well, maybe we mistakenly believe that we will have to give up too many things from our old life that we enjoy. We don't realize that the worldly things that Jesus calls us to give up are the exact things that are holding us back. All of us know people who are not Christians. Many of them don't want their lives exposed in God's light because they're afraid of what will be revealed. They don't want to be changed. Don't be surprised if unbelievers are threatened by your desire to obey God and do what is right because they are afraid that the light in you may expose some of the darkness in them. But don't be discouraged. Just keep praying that they will respond to the Spirit's call and come to see how much better it is to live in the light rather than the darkness. Yes. As Christians, we need to be careful that we don't end up in the shadows. Sometimes with the very best of intentions, we get so focused and busy doing church work that we fail to be the church. Our reciting the creeds in church can take the place of our actually living them. We can learn about the Bible, but fail to be shaped by the Bible. Like Nicodemus, we can be in the shadows. Maybe we're listening to Jesus from a distance, or maybe we've stopped listening altogether. Jesus is calling us to come out of the shadows of doubt, and fear and uncertainty and come back into the story. He's talking to us. He created us. He died for us. And his spirit is alive and well, helping our faith to grow and giving us guidance for our lives. He tells us what we need to know, not what we think we need to know. Being a disciple of Christ is life-changing. Just ask Mary Magdalene. She looked into his face and became a pure woman. Ask Matthew. He encountered Jesus and became an honest man. Ask Paul. When he met Jesus, his zeal for persecuting Christians became a zeal for love. And ask Peter. After he met Jesus, he opened his heart and shared the gospel with Gentiles. We are all broken and need to be healed and changed and repaired and forgiven. The question for us this morning is not what was Nicodemus searching for, but what are we searching for? Now is the time to 
come out of the shadows, to step into the light and hear the words of Jesus. 